Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ravi. I'm the co-founder CEO of Z. And today, uh, um, we are talking about tokenization of assets, fungible, non-fungible, and then there are various other token standards which are coming. Uh, so we'll t briefly talk about those also. Uh, <clears throat> so when we say tokenization by default, we mean uh, tokenization using blockchain technology. And when we say uh, uh, tokenization, we include digital assets, which are like native assets to the blockchain or uh, real world assets where we are creating tokenization or doing tokenization to create a digital representation in the form of a token. So when we talk about tokenization using blockchain, we talk about both, both different kinds of tokens. Uh, from a market perspective, um, you know, the tokenization assets could be almost 16 trillion by 2030. This is as per a BCG report uh, and, and it is uh, a huge growth as compared to the 310 billion uh, as, as in 2022. And, and the reason is very clear because when we include real world assets, then we are talking about a huge amount of uh, assets, you know. The real estate asset, asset itself is a $3 trillion industry. And then similarly, if you talk about financial assets and other assets like carbon credits or bonds or royalties, etc., there are quite a few assets which are not being managed uh, uh, properly today or do not have a very robust asset lifecycle management. All those, if we uh, or, or even a percentage of those assets being tokenized using blockchain, we are going to see uh, uh, such a huge number by 2030. And as BCG rightly said, the tokenized assets are expected to comprise 10% of the global GDP by, by 2030, which again is a very large statement. Uh, saying 10% of global GDP, GDP means, you know, it's a huge uh, amount that we are talking about. So tokenization of assets is one of the most powerful use cases of blockchain. And uh, uh, I would say it's quite established um, as we are seeing not just startups, but a lot of enterprises uh, getting into tokenization of different kind of assets. So the asset categories may be different, but the uh, intent and the value which is being derived is, is pretty much the same across industries. So that is the reason, you know, we have been uh, talking about tokenization uh, has become a buzzword in last two years. Um, and, and we are now start, we started seeing a lot of actual implementations happening in the market. In fact, uh, we at Z uh, have got quite a few customers and developers who are, uh, uh, you know, building tokenization platforms or uh, specific asset category based uh, platforms for tokenizing different kind of assets. In fact, one of our uh, partner and, and, and client, Decom has you know, launched a complete layer one blockchain, which is focused on tokenization of real world assets. So this is a, uh, uh, I would say opportunity of the decade where we are going to see a, uh, blockchain penetrate every sector, every vertical and, and tokenization being one of the most established use case for that. Now, uh, if we talk about asset lifecycle management, so asset uh, uh, is not something new. You know, we have been managing assets for uh, a long, long time. And if you talk about finance, finance is pretty much uh, uh, asset and liability management, where asset forms one side of it. And if you talk about uh, fractionalization of assets, that again has been there for centuries. Um, if you see real estate investment trust, the whole concept of real estate investment trust is there's an organization which holds a portfolio of various real estate properties. And then, you know, they have, uh, uh, they, they have converted their shares and, and those shares can be taken by different individuals. So if you are, in, if you want to invest into property, one way is you directly buy the property. The second way is you take shares of a real estate investment trust, which is managing that property. So whatever capital appreciation you will have, whatever uh, uh, recurring cash flow through rent or, or other income would be, you can still uh, uh, benefit out of that uh, just by investing into the shares of a real estate investment trust called REIT. So REIT has been a very uh, uh, 
common model in the real estate world similarly we have mutual funds so the same goes the, the philosophy is pretty much the same so one way to take an exposure in any organization let's say you want to buy shares of tcs you can go to the stock market you can buy those shares but uh, tcs shares you know may be very expensive and you may be able to buy just you know 5 10 or 20 and even if you buy 100 or 1000 still your portfolio is not very diversified so the concept of mutual fund came in because uh, mutual funds are organizations which basically uh, uh, have got specific fund managers who are professionals experts uh, who bring those um, you know who, who researches into the market and bring all the promising stock into one fund and then you can uh, uh, take a part of the fund so the mutual fund is broken into units and you can buy certain units of a mutual fund so that way uh, uh, you are now owner of not just one uh, asset like TCS but you are actually part owner of a basket of assets so that is how uh, uh, these traditional so we, we, we see that you know these kind of structures are already there where you know we are doing asset fractionalization but if you see the traditional uh, uh, asset lifecycle management, asset management piece, uh, there are quite a few problems. The one problem is, uh, the major, major problem is liquidity. And I was uh, reading a statement that liquidity to a token or an asset is, is pretty much same like oxygen is to humans. So liquidity uh, is, is the most important part of a, um, an asset because if the asset has low liquidity, it's difficult to move asset. So what do you mean by liquidity? So if, if let's say uh, you have a real estate property and that property is worth a million dollars and let's say uh, um, you require funds, maybe due to personal reason, maybe business reason, so maybe any other reason. Now, if you want to uh, uh, sell that property, it would be difficult because selling a property takes a huge amount of time. And the reason is, the reason may be, uh, one of the reason is, is low liquidity because there may be limited set of buyers who would be interested to buy a property at the time that you want to sell. So it takes time to reach out to a uh, uh, larger number of buyers. So that is what we call low liquidity. Typically in a, in a market like India, uh, still we have a high liquidity of real estate, but there are quite a few assets where you'll find uh, liquidity is one major talent due to which it is difficult to sell and buy those assets. And if you can't, uh, uh, the tradability of assets, selling and buying becomes difficult, we call that low liquidity. The second, of course, is inaccessibility. So when we say inaccessibility, the asset has got a lot of compliances today. It's difficult uh, uh, for you to buy stocks, let's say in Europe, or uh, stocks of some South American country. <clears throat> because today the stock market, you know, you buy shares typically within your own country. And there are a few exchange traded funds or mutual funds which allow you to take some exposure in international shares but largely uh, um, as per compliance you can buy shares within your own country what the stock market within your own country so in, in, in india for example sensex or or nifty you know whatever shares they offer uh, you are you are only able to buy those so accessibility is, is a major challenge and then there's the accessibility from a financial inclusion perspective that you know, uh, there are a lot of challenges whereby people are not able to access uh, uh, financial assets. So there is a, a large chunk of population today globally who are outside the financial system, and so financial inclusion is a is a major challenge due to which inaccessibility to a different kind of assets coming, especially financial assets. Lack of monetization is is pretty much similar to uh, uh, low liquidity because. When there's low liquidity, there are uh, or low participation from retail investors. It's difficult to monetize uh, the holding of assets, and the cost of carrying asset is is uh, very inefficient. Uh, <clears throat> it is very high due to inefficiency. So the way asset life cycle is managed today is actually very difficult. Uh, in fact, two days back there was a news that India is now moving to T plus one settlement time, which is again is a great news. Uh, traditionally. And, and most of the countries, including US, China, still the settlement time is T plus two. So when we say settlement time, if you buy a stock, you would be able to get the physical custody or the actual custody of the stock in two days time. Today, T plus two means two, plus two days after two days. And, and the reason is because the back-end settlement, the, the back-end process, how you manage the asset 
still uh, has got a lot of intermediaries, a lot of inefficiencies, and that's why it takes a lot of time. So, um, <clears throat> and, and traditionally also we are trying to improve. And with blockchain, you know, there's a going to be a huge change uh, how we manage assets. So blockchain brings in a lot of efficiency. So inefficiencies again is a, is a major problem in today asset management. And then of course, you know, uh, retail participation is one of the other challenge. And the challenge is that let's say there's a, uh, a an artwork which is very expensive, uh, a painting or it may be a, a real estate property and, and you are very confident that you know there's a huge appreciation value and you want to invest into it but since it may be a, a few million dollars and you may not be willing to invest that kind of money so in, in that case that uh, fractionalization options are, are not available today so uh, that again is without tokenization <clears throat> that again is a major problem and that's why retail investors are not able to participate in those kind of assets so they are inaccessible from that perspective. So these are uh, some of the major challenges in the traditional asset management uh, life cycle. And that is where, you know, tokenization, blockchain based tokenization come into picture to solve these kind of challenges. So um, <clears throat> what is tokenization? So if you see tokenization is a process by which, you know, you are creating a digital replica or a representation of an asset on the blockchain. Uh, and just to give a brief about how uh, assets are being managed on blockchain. So blockchain is a technology where you have an asset, uh, which we call token. And that token, uh, uh, you know, all the transactions of that token are managed in a blockchain, is in, 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 a, in a decentralized ledger. And once the transactions are committed to the ledger, those are immutable. So that way, you have a token where you can have a complete immutable audit trail of that transactions and second through some token standards uh, you can take custody of a token so there's a token standard which define what the token is what the metadata is and then <clears throat> once you have custody of that token in your wallet then you become the absolute owner of that until unless you use your private key nobody would be able to access that uh, asset or claim that asset it's only you with the access to your private key would be able to move or sell those assets so that is the concept of tokenization when we talk about blockchain. That it allows you to, uh, uh, token is a digital representation uh, on the blockchain of an asset. And that token itself may be, may be the asset or token may be representing, representing some other asset. Uh, so both can be, uh, um, you know, stored, created, stored and, and tracked on the blockchain. So that's what we call asset tokenization on blockchain. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, the value being driven by blockchain based tokenization is so huge and it solves uh, um, all the major challenges that we see today in the asset tokenization world uh, that whatever can be tokenized will be tokenized uh, in, in the years to come. So um, <clears throat> different kind of tokens. Initially, of course, you know, the first token that we uh, saw a blockchain based token was Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin was created as a payment token, uh, a peer to peer cash system where Bitcoin represent uh, um, a currency. And that's why they are called cryptocurrencies. So not all tokens that you see crypto tokens, they are currencies. Cryptocurrencies are only those tokens which are meant to be payment tokens. So um, <clears throat> first one was Bitcoin which was uh, is, is a payment token as well as a utility token. So some of the tokens, you know, fall into multiple categories. And uh, uh, so cryptocurrencies are a classic example, you know, Dash and Monero and then few other uh, cryptocurrencies came in, Litecoin uh, and so on and so forth. And then, you know, in terms of payment tokens, so these are native uh, tokens and I'll, I'll explain that a bit later. Uh, so these are the tokens which are which are sites in the blockchain and the token itself is the uh, uh, you know it, it is the asset. The second example is stable coins. Now stable coins is something where the asset lies outside. So if you take an example of USDT or USDC, uh, two of the most uh, uh, famous, and then you know BUSD uh, from Binance. Uh, so these are some of the stable coins which are backed by fiat currencies. And uh, um, so in this case, 
the token resides on the blockchain but the underlying dollar that like the dollar or the cash which is uh being represented by the token that resides traditionally in the bank account or in the form of some other cash and cash equivalents so um um so there's a combination of a native token uh, plus an underlying asset and then you know cbdc is is something which a lot of governments across the world are uh dealing with you know they are building cbdc in fact india has launched uh, um a, a poc of e rupee which again is a cbdc so cbdc is centrally bank issued digital currency and uh the idea is that you know how we can bring the value of blockchain or distributed ledgers uh to create a system where you know uh, uh, the money can be managed as an asset can be managed in the form of uh, cbdc so initially uh, uh, the major use case of cbdc uh, uh, being tried out is interbank settlements or settlement between the central bank and the other banks so uh, so there's a lot of a wholesale um, exchange of funds that take place so that can be if you want to bring the efficiency of blockchain you can bring that and and you know uh, bring in a lot of efficiency into the whole process of um, uh, the transactions as well as the settlement of of those transactions so these are our uh, traditional assets we fiat currencies and then you know digital asset being payment tokens the second kind of traditional asset we see you know uh, are something of value so if you have a voucher or loyalty points or tickets or anything you know which is like um, uh, you may have a physical ticket or a digital ticket or a, a royalty points within your wallet so these are all different kind of uh, assets which have their value so those are also again uh, uh, you know in 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 the case of blockchain they become utility tokens so utility tokens is something which provides you utility uh, like for example ether in the case of ethereum blockchain so ether is a utility you use that ether to pay for the gas fee so if you are executing a smart contract uh, or you are doing a transaction on blockchain or interacting with a smart contract to do a transaction you would require gas so if you are sending money to someone you would require gas and and you will use ether to pay for that gas fee so uh, so ethereum uh, is providing you a utility and you are using ether to uh, uh, accomplish that so that's why they are called utility tokens so any kind of tokens where you know there is some utility like let's say for example uh if you see decentralized exchanges where you can use the token again to pay for the transaction fee so that's a utility that we are using then you know uh, third are uh, physical or digital assets so whether it be equity shares or debts or bonds that typically we see in the traditional asset space and the equivalent for that is the security tokens or asset backed tokens in the blockchain space so security tokens are uh, like for example if a company has shares and they want to tokenize the shares and then instead of um, going through the share registry you can basically sell uh, sell those shares using the token registry so those are called security tokens and similarly we have asset backed tokens so your physical gold or um digital gold can be tokenized and uh, sold as tokens similarly your bond uh, bonds is again a very big market there are already quite a few pocs which are being done and some real transactions have also been done by uh, some of the players in the market so asset backed tokens or security tokens are another area so these are some of the different token types and then you know uh, we'll talk about some of the token standards and and uh, um types based on standards and and the utility okay so uh, i'll i'll take up one question in between so uh, someone has asked how tokenization is different from shares as we already have real estate shares which is pretty much similar to tokenization so in philosophy yes what you are seeing is just one aspect of tokenization that you are breaking something into units but tokenization is not just that when we say blockchain based tokenization we are we are saying that you are creating a token uh, smart contract for a specific asset onto the blockchain and once you have created that token standard that token can be transacted easily 
in a decentralized way, in a non-custodial way, if you are holding a token in your MetaMask wallet, let's say an NFT or, or Ether or any, any kind of crypto token, you can simply transfer that by knowing the address without using any intermediary. So when we say blockchain-based tokenization, it's not just converting them to units, which you are right, absolutely today also exists in the traditional world. And, and in the first slide, I, I tried to explain that using real estate investment trusts or mutual funds. That's how uh, tokenization or, or fractionalization is being done. But when we say blockchain-based tokenization, it's not just uh, converting them into units. It's about the complete uh, set of value which blockchain technology brings around. Having absolute ownership of the asset, having ease of transacting that asset without using it intermediaries and almost near real-time settlement. As soon as the transaction happens, finality of the settlement happens, which does not happen in the traditional uh, financial infrastructure. And the second question was, I'll, I'll take it up uh, later in the, in, in the process. So what can we tokenize? These are some of the examples. If you see intangible assets like patents or licenses, software licenses, royalties. Royalties are already, you know, uh, if you have transacted with any NFT. So if you create an NFT, the owner of the NFT can actually, uh, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> define what kind of royalty they would, um, uh, they would like to have, right? And then as Whenever a, a, a tran NFT transaction will take place in the secondary market, at that point of time, that royalty will automatically be deducted from the transaction as a fee and uh, goes to the asset owner, the actual creator or the owner of the asset. And then, you know, we have uh, uh, tangible assets like, you know, precious metals, gold, silver, or real estate, uh, carbon credits, etc. And then there are collectibles where, you know, the whole uh, NFT boom started two years back with, you know, uh, virtual collectibles, avatar projects, and then, you know, extending that to devices like medical devices, electronic devices. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, uh, financial instruments like bonds, mutual funds, equity. Um, now extending that to further, if you talk about non-transferable tokens, uh, we talk about your um, certificates, um, you know, all different kind of certificates, whether it be academic credentials to, you know, business credentials, etc. So tokenization, I think, uh, pretty much touches all different kind of asset categories today that we have. Now, uh, so this is one again difference I briefly mentioned earlier. That is a uh, uh, type of asset tokens based on whether they are native to the blockchain or they are representing uh, representing something which is outside the blockchain. So tokens uh, which are native to the blockchain, for example, Bitcoin or Ether. Now these tokens are, are uh, the complete life cycle is being managed within the blockchain. So they are created, so the way uh, it has been architected, uh, new tokens are created as a reward or as an incentive to the people who are managing the blockchain. In the case of Bitcoin, we call them miners or in the case of Ethereum, we call them stakers or validators. So they are the people who are writing, who are verifying, validating each transaction and then storing them into the block, uh, in, in, uh, as a block into the blockchain. And then they are rewarded uh, or incentivized in the form of tokens. So there's a mechanism to generate new tokens. And then all the token transactions happen uh, from one address to another address using private key. Uh, so all those transactions are stored in the distributed ledger. And then, you know, uh, that is synced up across the uh, entire network of nodes. So these tokens are native to the blockchain and they can be traded on chain. There are, uh, and, 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 and the examples, as I mentioned, all different kind of tokens that we see uh, on the blockchain, like Ether, Bitcoin, etc., are uh, native tokens. The second, uh, as I mentioned, when we talk about real world assets, how to tokenize them, then we create a digital representation of that asset onto the blockchain. So for example, take gold. You can say that, okay, I'm creating a gold token. That is each token is representing one gram of gold or one ounce of gold. So you are, uh, your token is representing a certain quantity of gold. Similarly, let's say you can say one token is equivalent to one carbon credit or one bond, right? So, uh, so there's a, there's a, a separate asset that is being represented by the uh, token on the blockchain. 
so there's a combination so these are tokens which are representing something so there's a combination of on chain and off chain so tokens that you have created which are representing these real world assets they are on chain and they are traded on chain but the underlying asset is off chain and we design as a, a system where you know the, the sufficient information of that uh, off chain asset or the underlying asset is put on chain to make the connection so uh, you talk about real estate or art or commodities like gold silver etc or as i mentioned in the case of even stable coins like usdt or usdc the cash is, uh, is is something which is residing outside the blockchain and there's a digital ripple effect so most of the tokenization that you are going to see is of this kind where tokenization or token is representing an another asset most of the nft in the case of nfts also the nft asset is actually representing something else so there may be a digital art or an avatar or or something uh, that is being represented by the non fungible token or nft uh <clears throat> now if you talk about from a token economy perspective so uh there are primarily two standards and there are few other standards that have come up but i'll talk about first you know fungible and non fungible so fungible and non fungible token means that you know if the underlying asset is fungible when we say fungible that means a property of fungibility that an asset and another asset they are same exactly same so one gram of gold and another gram of gold are exactly the same they can be exchanged with each other if they have the same carat uh, or, or 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 the quality similarly you know a 100 rupee note can be exchanged with another 100 rupee note or a 100 rupee note can be broken into 5 20 rupee note right so that's a property called fungibility so when the underlying assets are fungible and you tokenize a fungible asset they are called fungible tokens So, if you talk about shares of a specific company, each uh, share is is exactly the same. Um, our cash, you know, the fiat currencies that we use, they are fungible. Uh, a, a specific currency, if you talk about. So, these are all fungible tokens or fungible assets. And then, similarly, we have uh, 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 non-fungible tokens, which represent non-fungible assets. so a specific property is is entirely different from another property and artwork is different from another artwork so they are different they are non fungible they cannot be exchanged freely uh, with one another they are not identical or similar and that's why you know they are called non fungible tokens because they represent non fungible assets and then you know as we mentioned tangible and intangible so intangible are digital assets tangible are your real world assets like a car or gold or physical gold or real estate etc uh so these are these are tangible and then you know uh, identity again a national identity being tokenized onto blockchain so these are all uh, tangible assets so this is how we divide um fungible non fungible tangible and intangible and based on that you know these uh, various examples have been given so if you see payment tokens for example we talked about bitcoin or ether now uh uh so they are intangible assets so they may be non fungible as compared to bitcoin and ether but within bitcoin each bitcoin is is exactly same similar to another bitcoin so within bitcoin if you talk about one specific cryptocurrency then they are fungible assets if you talk about two two different currencies like ether and bitcoin they are non fungible they are not exactly same yes they can be exchanged with each other at a certain uh, price ratio but they are otherwise different kind of assets operating on different blockchains altogether so um <clears throat> one uh, type of token which i'll mention here is the non transferable token so there are few assets that are non transferable in nature in the sense that there's no point that you, you can't sell them so for example your identity do you hold a national identity your aadhar id or your emirates id or your social security number now that's a unique identity your own identity so you can tokenize that for specific reasons so let's say in the case of metaverse if you want uh, a metaverse may say that you know um only these identities can uh, um participate in a specific event or get access to a specific event or metaverse now that entry to a event 
or to a metaverse may be based on an identity so you tokenize the identity and then you know the uh, metaverse contract can read that identity and see whether you know it's whitelisted or not and accordingly give access to that person so uh, but naturally you would not be transferring or you would not be selling uh, uh, a tokenized identity because that belongs to a person and, and it will always be retained by the person similarly uh, if you talk about academic credentials your academic credentials or your job credentials or the experiences can be tokenized now why we tokenize them so that it become easy for them you to share when you apply for higher studies or for a job and and the other person can easily verify them using blockchain based uh, uh, credential management or credential verification so uh, but again you would not be selling them not not transferring them uh, like you know transferring the ownership so these are called non transferable tokens so when we say transferable here does not mean you cannot send you, you can send or you can share with someone but transferable here means ownership transfer so these are kind of tokens uh, like you know your identity your personal credentials uh, these are called uh, these are coded by non transferable tokens and then there is a, a new standard which has come up recently a uh, few months back uh, which is called semi fungible tokens so there are few use cases where you know you require a mix of fungible and non fungible because in the case of fungible tokens since they are fungible the quality of the token is remain same is is exactly the same but the quantity varies in the case of non fungible tokens quantity typically is one but the uh, uh, quality varies so one artwork is entirely different from another artwork with different set of metadata but there are kind of assets and use cases where you require a mix of two so you require unique properties but at the same time you do require multiple quantities and that is where you use semi fungible tokens so these are typically four different kind of standards and new standards are being defined uh, based on specific use case use case specific tokens are also there uh, but largely fungible non fungible non transferable tokens uh, and semi fungible token now uh tokenization of physical assets this i think is the major uh, as i mentioned you know the larger category because uh, physical or digital assets to uh, assets which are not native to the blockchain so this is how uh, and, and i think that was the second question uh, i'm taking that up so there's an option world where you have pre existing real world assets they may be digital assets like bonds or mutual funds or they may be physical assets like you know real estate or gold or so on so forth and then there's a on chain world where you are creating a digital representation in the form of tokens representing those assets so how this process works one of the uh, critical aspect of this is called proof of assets or proof of reserves and the idea of proof of reserves is that if you are creating a token which represents a physical token or a real world asset then of course that underlying real world asset has to be secure so just imagine you are tokenizing gold and you have you know 100 kilograms of gold that you have tokenized one token representing 1 gram of gold now you created all these tokens and you have sold these tokens people are buying these tokens and people are transacting on these tokens but if the underlying gold is not secured what is the value of those tokens nothing so the value of the token is is there only because there is an underlying gold, gold which is uh, which it represents so the underlying gold has to be uh, uh, properly secured and proof of reserve is a method by which you know a gold is let's say put into a vault or a custodian and then you know uh, it cannot be moved by the gold owner until unless there is a number of tokens which uh, are are given in exchange so how the uh, i'll take an example of gold to illustrate this process So, for example, there is a process by which gold comes in. You buy gold, and then you put that gold into a vault. A vault is going to sign that they have received a certain amount of gold, and then there there would be a third party auditor that will come in and again verify that yes, this many this much gold has been brought into the vault and stored there. Once these signatures are put into the blockchain as an on chain uh, uh, confirmations, then equivalent number of tokens would be generated by the smart contract 
and when you are redeeming physical gold the exact same process uh, uh, reverse process will happen so let's say you want to withdraw gold and sell it physical gold then uh, uh, you have to have access to tokens and those tokens will be burned and so if if let's say as a user you have got some gold tokens you can go to the vault you can give your tokens there and you can get physical gold and at, as soon as the physical gold is redeemed the digital tokens will be burned the equivalent number of tokens will be burned so this becomes a whole cycle there's a process whenever a phys- new physical gold comes into the vault the tokens will be generated and the reverse happens whenever the physical gold is redeemed so this is how you create a combination of off chain and on chain and you secure the underlying assets and there has to be a proper smart contract driven process by which you know these assets come into custody and go out of the custody so every point of time each token should be pegged uh, directly with the underlying asset and and that is what a proof of reserve is where you are cre- creating a proof for all the token holders that the underlying assets are well secured and they exist so um that's why i've already explained this so uh, so there you know um, a third party custodian or a vault etc becomes very important and having a third party auditor and few independent uh, parties who verify and validate the whole process and sign those transactions on the blockchain becomes very important to establish a proof of reserve and at, until there is a proper proof of reserve has been established asset backed tokens does not make any sense nobody is going to trust or or buy those tokens because they lack trust there in the case of digital assets also it's pretty much the same so when we talk about uh, if digital assets are not native to the blockchain so for example you are tokenizing bonds or a company shares or uh, uh, for example um, um, um carbon credits etc which are available in the digital form but still uh, uh, so again you need to have a custodian who will take the custody like the simplest example is the usdt stable coins so in the case of fiat stable coins the equivalent amount of cash like if you talk about usdt if they have 50 billion usdt in the market tokens then 50 billion uh, worth of cash should be in the bank either in the form of government bonds or Uh, cash or cash equivalents, but they, they, there should be equivalent amount of uh, uh, cash which the USDT represents. So that is what uh, uh, a proof of reserve in the case of fiat stable coin would be. Now uh, the third is where you know you have token native to the blockchain. So now you know, um, for example, bonds. one option is that you have a bond which is outside in a financial bond and you are tokenizing it and making use of blockchain to bring in efficiency into the process the second approach is you are creating the bond you are you are completely uh, transforming the whole uh, asset life cycle by creating the bond on the on the blockchain itself then it becomes a native token then that bond has been issued on blockchain directly there is no um, bond which is outside the chain there is no off chain asset in in that case so that native assets apart from i'm talking about like ether bitcoin etc is very easy to understand all crypto tokens that we see uh, for blockchains they are native uh, assets to the blockchain but in the uh, some of the traditional assets are now being transformed into native assets uh, in the form of tokenization on blockchain bonds being one one classic example for doing that similarly royalties etc when we tokenize them or uh, uh, ticketing so one of our uh, partner customers block tickets who are big time into uh, ticketing of uh, um, you know all your entertainment tickets movie tickets etc using nfts and there again there would not be any physical representation of that ticket that nft ticket that you have got is the absolute asset you can take that nft go to the event or the movie and and show it and get access to the event so these are like native uh, assets so in the native assets you do not require a separate proof of reserve etc you can manage everything within the blockchain and using smart contracts uh <clears throat> now uh let's talk about tokenization in perspective of permission dlt and permissionless dlc dlt 
so there are two kind of blockchain ledgers today or technology uh, uh, the way protocols are being designed so most of the common one that we see are called public protocols or permissionless decentralized ledger technologies so all your ether polygon binance etc are all public protocols when we say public protocols they are permissionless means you do not require a uh, explicit permission to join the network you can today go and and download the ether client you can get all the transactions you can create a wallet you can start transacting so uh, they are very high on financial inclusion there is no permissioning which is required so um of course you know when we talk about token creation you can create any token like ethereum launched a erc20 standard whereby you can go and you can deploy a smart contract and create your own token you define your own the name of the token symbol of the token supply of the token and any restrictions that you want to put in so these are permissionless uh, uh, protocols where you know anyone can go without uh, they do not any any permissions and and be part of it when we uh, uh, saw you know blockchain being adopted in the enterprise space of course they required some kind of permissioning if somebody is running a supply chain network or if somebody is running a invoice accounting marketplace uh, enterprises do require that only suppliers or uh, suppliers and buyers or exporters and importers only a specific set of entities would be able to gain access to the information on the network so that's why the concept of permissioning came in and uh, uh, permissioned protocols like Some of the common examples are Hyperledger, Fabric, or R3 Coda, Dragon Chain, etc. Came in. So there are variety of use cases now with tokenization. We are seeing even hybrid uh, kind of approach, where you have some pieces like you know, uh, external auditor signing on proof of reserves is something which is a permissioned actor, but at the same time, all the token transactions uh, can be viewed by anyone in the public, and anyone can. Uh, um, do transactions so there's those are uh, in in a very permissionless way so there's a hybrid approach where you have some of the transactions and entities or features which are uh, like public protocol and some of the features still require some permissioning or access controls which are like permission ones so um and and that's why we we are seeing you know uh, blockchains like dcom coming in which are uh, you know specifically being designed where you'll find proof of asset as a native component uh to enable real world asset tokenization and then you know the concept of subnets or avalanche subnets or polygon supernets etc is coming in which allows you to um create different flavors of of pure permission to pure public and some somewhere in between like hybrid or um a hybrid blockchains so now uh, uh lastly you know i would like to talk about uh, some of the challenges uh that are being managed so one of the challenges that of course when we talk about let's say real world assets like real estate so when you are transacting in real estate it's not as simple uh, as it seems so it's not that simply you tokenize a real estate and you start transacting no because uh there the ownership is not just the token part of it there needs to be a physical proof also of that ownership and then there are compliances of the country that you are operating in that compliance may require that you know certain properties can be bought by only indian residents in india right and and all countries have different kind of rules as to who can buy what kind of assets within a country when we they talk about nationals or citizens or non citizens and so on so forth right so uh, uh of course when we if if we want to increase the adoption of real world asset tokenization within the real space uh, real world of course we need to comply with these all these compliances or regulations of the state so um one of the classic component is is decentralized identity uh where you, you you can combine the decentralized identity or your cryptographic identity of your wallet with a real world identity so that now you have one identity you can still use it on metamask like wallet uh but at the same time it is attached to your real world identity so you there's a physical proof also of the ownership of an asset second as i mentioned proof of reserves is is something very important uh third you know um for transacting in assets we do require the value of asset so if we talk about physical assets like real estate etc the process of finding or price discovery is is through appraisals do you appraise an asset every quarter every or half yearly or yearly 
and then you come to know the fair market value of that asset now blockchain typically uh, the smart contracts are designed in such a way that they cannot interact directly with a uh, with a database through an api and for that purpose we need to have oracles so oracles are are, are you know uh, uh, special components through which um, feeds or data can be brought into smart contract smart contract would be able to read the data for example if you are buying gold gold tokens you would like to know the current price of gold so based on the current price of gold of course you'll be willing to pay that that price only for the for the token so if you are buying a token which is represented by 1 gram of gold you ought to know the price of 1 gram of gold as of now at the time of buying the tokens so these price feeds uh, we use decentralized oracles to get these price feeds and then you know the uh, this can happen so uh, these are some of the challenges and how they are being managed today or or being thought of or or designed to circumvent these those challenges primarily being uh, uh, compliances and regulations and as you know government initiatives start happening in this space uh, some countries have already started doing this it will start from uh, uh, it, it will move from you know initially few asset types to you know uh, uh, all the other asset types so that becomes very important um, um how you know we are going to see a larger adoption of blockchain or, or tokenization of real world assets and then you know having a uh, favorable policies where uh, like you know some countries have now started allowing native tokenization of company shares the so one option is that you have a company registered with with roc and then you have shares and you tokenize them but then you are creating just a representation and the actual shares are are in the share registry but then now few countries have passed on regulation where you can actually have a complete organization with tokenized shares so there will not be a, a separate shares in the share registry whatever shares you have in the token registry they are the only shares and that they can be transacted like any other token so these kind of uh, uh, initiatives are, are are happening from the uh, Uh, policies and compliances side where you know a lot of governments are taking efforts um to ease out norms or transform some of the norms to enable tokenization of real world assets uh where zeev fits into the picture so uh zeev is one of the leading blockchain infrastructure as a service platform in the world um and we provide blockchain infrastructure um you know and support almost 20 plus blockchain protocols including permission ones like fabric art recorder to all the major public protocols whether it be binance or tron or polygon ethereum etc avalanche and so on and so forth so uh, zeev you know if you are building anything in blockchain any tokenization platform any defi platform or nft marketplace you can use use zeev to you know uh connect with different blockchains using our shared apis or dedicated nodes or ledger data apis um so you don't need to worry about uh, anything about the blockchain infrastructure we ensure we take care of your uh, infrastructure in a very enterprise grade um high level of security and performance and um we have have experience of more than 6 years building blockchain applications and for last 2 years fully focused on uh, blockchain infrastructure So if you have any project uh, uh we have a very seasoned team who can help you uh design the architecture and manage your infrastructure. Uh you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh you can also visit our website or join our Telegram or Twitter group and you'll keep posted uh keep updated with what whatever is happening. We do monthly webinars, lot of talk series, meetups and hackathons. So do join us and and some of the web3 initiatives if you would It, at any stage if you want to move from web 2 to web 3 learn basics of web 3 to something if you are building already building in web 3 and you require some support on the infrastructure uh we can help you accelerate your journey in the web 3 space uh so now i'll i think we have got a couple more questions so one of the question is which framework is best in market today for tokenization interoperability is the big challenge so you are absolutely right i am sorry i i did not touch upon the interoperability but thankfully you know now various methods have come in through which you know interoperability is being taken place so polkadot uh, came up with xcmp messaging system and now avalanche is uh, 
is, is, is started offering interoperability. They have already launched with Ethereum and now they are coming up with interoperability of not just assets, but some arbitrary data also with other blockchains. So, uh, yeah, so interoperability is now being solved. Uh, as far as, you know, we already have IBC, which is, you know, uh, very common in the uh, famous in the Cosmos ecosystem. And then Ripple also used it for, uh, um, you know, interoperating assets across various banking networks. So, um, yes, it is a, uh, uh, it is definitely a challenge, but now it is already being solved and a lot of initiatives are already there. And some of the, uh, uh, and, and there are quite a few startups also who are providing interoperable chains, which are multi-chain network, and you can transfer assets from one chain to another. Uh, there are some um, uh, other components like blockchain bridges, etc. But now more native interoperability frameworks are coming in, which will enable this. The second question you asked about which framework is best in the market today for tokenization. So I think uh, I'm, I'm not clear about the question. So uh, basically for tokenization, you build smart contracts. From a platform perspective, yes, as I mentioned, there are general purpose blockchains like Ethereum, Polygon or Avalon. And there are specific uh, uh, blockchains like DCOM, DCO, Double M, uh, who are, you know, who have uh, uh, customized the blockchain specifically for real world asset tokenization. So you can use uh, either of them. Of course, platforms like DCOM will, will help you solve compliance challenges, some of the other challenges like, you know, proof of reserves or decentralized identity, etc. And in the case of general purpose blockchain, you may end up building some of these components yourself. Uh, so one question is, did you, uh, do you provide certificate for attending this event? Um, so that's a very interesting question. In fact, we are, uh, we have come up with an initiative right now. Um, we are just in the final stages of testing it out. So uh, starting up um, December 25th, when we had our first meetup event uh, in, in Delhi, we are going to provide not just not, not certificate per se, but we are going to provide NFT token to every attendee, whether you attend our meetup or webinar or any such. And, and you can collect these NFTs and these NFTs will then, you know, uh, give you access to it. it of course, we'll have metadata as to what you have attended, uh, the nature of the uh, uh, the meetup or the webinar that you have attended but at the same time uh, these nfts will also give you access to uh, uh, z platform some uh, discount some uh, restricted access or, or exclusive access to some of the meetups and hackathons in future so there are quite a few things that we are planning in future and uh, if you have been attending or, or you know joining us uh, in our web3 initiatives of course we we want to uh, share all the benefits with everyone So uh, that's it for today. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for attending this webinar. If you have any questions, as I mentioned, please join our Twitter, Telegram, LinkedIn, or you know, fill up the contact form. You can connect me directly uh, with, with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Thank you.